November 1989, Daytona, Florida. Richard Mallory was doing what he'd done many times before. Well, let's get started. He'd gone to a bar, picked up a woman hitchhiker and drove her to a lonely spot. But this time, the woman he'd picked up was Eileen Wuornos, who was about to become a serial killer. Starting with Richard Mallory. Wuornos was 33 when she killed Mallory. Her life until then had been one of abandonment, violence, prison, and sexual abuse. She'd come to hate men, and now she'd finally done what she'd often wanted to do, kill a man just for being a man. She covered parts of Mallory's body, especially his face, with rubbish she found nearby before driving off in his car. The blood-stained Cadillac was found abandoned in downtown Daytona two days later. Detective Bob Kelly was the first to examine the vehicle. The registered owner was traced to Richard Mallory. Floor is clean. Two weeks later, his body was found. In Florida's heat, that's a long time for a body. Detective Bob Kelly took charge. Kelly, once a Boston cop, had recently come to Florida to the Volusia County Sheriff's Department for a change of climate. Now Kelly was learning what the climate does to corpses. We lose a lot of evidence due to uh, both insect and animal activity in the state of Florida. This particular one was in November. We were a little luckier because the, uh, it was cooler. In the middle of summer, we'll lose a, a body in a couple days. Uh, the northern states don't have to battle with that as often as we do. And we do lose a lot of evidence on uh, crime scenes because of decomposition. But as far as working homicides or any kind of violent crime, it can take its toll and you have to learn to tolerate it. Doesn't mean you accept it, doesn't mean you are numb to it, you just learn to tolerate it and understand it. But you have to be able to put up a barrier and if you can't put that barrier up, then it's possible maybe you need to do something else. You can't become personalized with these, these cases. It'll tear you up. First, the autopsy. They had to make sure about the cause of death. This was Kelly's case, and he was in on every part of it, even this one. Not everybody can go and handle the the trauma of watching a body go through a autopsy or seeing what it does to the families. Because not only do you have to deal with the fact that you've got a dead body, you have to deal with the families. And that's a tremendous loss and, and emotional part of the investigation. He's been out there for a little while. Do you know what caliber bullet he was shot with? Well, we don't know for sure yet. Well, let's take a look at the x-ray. The autopsy discovered that Mallory had been shot five times in the chest by a 22 caliber handgun. Get a picture of that. Well, let's get started. Five shots from a 22 caliber. It was unique. It was a little different. It was uh, maybe overkill. It was somebody that definitely wanted Mallory dead. Somebody that commits a murder like that takes a gun, points them at him, is, is either very cold or very angry. That's usually the bottom line on it. Somebody is mad when they're shooting and continuing to squeeze that trigger as often as they do. The way we found out that we were looking for a woman was by doing a background on Richard Mallory. Not only was Richard Mallory into the strip clubs and, and the prostitution, but it was also evident that 
he would not allow very many men around him. His acquaintances were female. He only hung out with females. So we didn't see him letting a male into the car. Richard Mallory had lived a lonely sort of life. He was 42, single, and a traveling electrical repairman. An evening's entertainment for him was usually sitting by himself in one of Florida's many topless bars. And just as his bedrooms were usually in motels, his sex was often with prostitutes or pickups. It was no mystery that a traveling man should have been passing through Daytona, and it wasn't much of one that he should have parked in the woods. But who with, and why was he killed? To find the killer, Bob Kelly had to immerse himself in Mallory's world of sex for sale, visiting the bars and strip clubs he was known to use across central Florida. Jeez, man, I am so beat up tonight. I don't know what Unknown to Bob Kelly, he was starting a murder trail that would dominate his life for two years. It was to be the biggest homicide case of his career. Looks like every other guy we've seen. No, I haven't seen him. Mm -mm, not at all. Very familiar to me. Six months after Mallory's murder, Eileen Warnos struck again, 300 miles north of Daytona. David Spears, 43, from the town of Winter Garden, stopped to pick up a woman hitchhiker. The woman was Eileen Warnos. The job of investigating Spears' death fell to the Orange County Sheriff's Department and Detective Jerry Thompson. What you got here? It's a mess, huh? Gosh. Wow. But no, uh, no clothes or anything, just the cap? Yeah, just as you've seen. Yeah. Looks like uh, he's been here a little while, too. Well, we discovered his body in the woods. Uh, it was a remote area off of US-19 in Citrus County. and. Uh, he was unclothed, uh, decomposed, uh, mummified state, and the only clothing he had on was a ball cap. You're thinking about preserving any and all evidence that's there. You start thinking about the investigation, think about identifying the body. Is there gonna be identification present there? Is it gonna be a person that you don't have any idea who he is or who she is? He had some unusual things recovered at the crime scene, uh, condoms, etc. And he kind of led us to believe that at least some female involvement was there. And a lot goes through your mind. It was difficult you know, to know you have somebody laying there dead that's someone's loved one. You know, it does have an effect on you. Spears was a divorced father of two. He operated heavy equipment on construction sites. He'd been shot six times by a 22 caliber pistol. There was no obvious reason for anyone to want to kill Spears. Everybody who knew him seemed to like him. Even his divorce had been amicable. We identified that David Spears was driving a truck at the time he was last seen, and we got a description of that truck and put it out again on the statewide teletype network and discovered that it had been recovered prior to his discovery in Marion County. It told us that whoever was involved in the murder case actually was with him in his vehicle at the time and had left there after the his murder and driven away in his truck. Thompson had less to go on than Kelly, but felt that whoever had been in the truck with Spears was almost certainly the killer. What kind of a person would that be? He consulted a psychological profiler who looks at the same evidence as the police, but from a different perspective. We became involved in the investigation after the David Spears homicide. When you have a crime, you have anybody in the whole world that could have committed it. If you can sit at a group and everyone can agree that the perpetrator is male or female, 
you cut the population of suspects in half just with that one estimation because of the way the victim was lying and that he was n nude and he had his baseball cap on still. What we thought had taken place was that uh, he had taken the clothes off himself and, that, and then put his baseball cap back on and that the perpetrator would be a female. The ability to lure the person into the wooded area and have them disrobe would be more of a woman type of crime. What are you doing? We saw the perpetrator of this crime as a murderer who robbed, not a person who was taking these men with their vehicles to get their personal belongings, their effects, their money. It wasn't a robbery that people just ended up getting killed. It was a murderer who robbed. As Dale Hinman began to profile Spears' killer, in Daytona, Bob Kelly's own system of profiling, his trawl through the world of vice, had led him to a stripper and prostitute named Chastity. It had been six months since Richard Mallory was killed, and Chastity came the closest so far to fitting Kelly's picture of the murderer. She was 27, was from a broken home, and had been working in the sex trade since she was 15. Selling cheap sex. I recognize this man. And that's what Mallory was all about. And he was what she was looking for, and she represented everything he wanted. Chastity at first denied knowing Mallory, but eventually she admitted that he was a regular client, one of many, but one that took a special interest in her. They'd met about a month before he died. He'd paid her $100 for sex and fell for it. He wanted her all to himself. A lot of the little indicators pointed that Chastity was involved in his death. She was here in the Daytona Beach area. She had, uh, she had been seen on several occasions with a gun, a 22 caliber pistol. There were other indicators that uh, she had some problems with Mallory, and she even bragged to her boyfriend that she was involved in Mallory's death. Chastity in the room. Convinced Chastity was Mallory's killer, Kelly brought her in for questioning, but she denied anything to do with his murder. About your relationship with Richard Mallory? Um, quite often, you know, you're very happy that uh, you're in the seat and they're in that seat. I wouldn't want to be in the position of being have to be interviewed for a murder. She said that she was involved with Mallory, that she had uh, had sexual activity with Mallory, but that she did not kill him. And it was after that interview that we kind of started to believe that maybe she didn't commit the murder. It was the worst moment because we had put so much work into bringing it to that point in the investigation. And then you realize that you've done all that for nothing. So stop wasting my time. Let her go. When it started to break down, I wouldn't say you're depressed because you last thing you want to do is put somebody that didn't commit a murder in jail. But now you've got to start from square one and start looking for the person that actually committed the murder. Bob Kelly, after clearing his chief suspect, hit a low point. I think it's easy to get sour. I think it's very easy to not put everything in the right perspective. It has to get to you. I mean, it, there are times when you can't help but take it home. His wife couldn't give him the new ideas he needed, but she did help. Looks like you could use another one of these. Oh, yeah, thank you. Most of us have learned to be able to put it aside and go home and shut off and be with your family. If you continue to bring it home, it's going to cause problems. 
really thought we had some. She's been very good about me um, working homicides for all this time. I've been working homicides for about 14 years now. And if you don't have somebody that uh, understands, you're not going to last. And I hope and I try to uh, just realize how good I have it, how uh, well things have gone for me compared to how poorly things go for other people. 300 miles apart, two detectives, Bob Kelly and Jerry Thompson, were investigating. But neither knew about the other, and neither had considered a serial killer. But Eileen Wuornos was about to kill again. Richard Mallory, David Spears, both dead. In Citrus County, Jerry Thompson, while checking neighboring county's homicide records, discovered a naked male body had been found five days after Spears had been killed. His car had been stolen and abandoned. We were in Sarasota doing the background investigation on David Spears, and we learned that Pasco County had recovered a male body off the interstate. At least one resident near where Conger's body was found... This time, the dead man was Charles Karskadden from Chapmansboro. He'd been shot nine times in the chest and back at point-blank range. Karskadden had only just gotten engaged to be married. Once you have two or more victims, you start looking for that classifies a person as a serial killer. An autopsy report released today shows a bullet killed the man found dead in the Ocala National Forest. But deputies won't say how many times he was shot. Deputies believe the man is 50-year-old Troy Eugene Burris of Ocala, but they're not yet certain. Three weeks later, Eileen Warnos struck again. The victim was Troy Burress. Jerry Thompson was well aware that if detectives had caught the killer by now, Burress would still be alive. I don't think you blame yourself. You start, what can I do? to prevent another one type feeling. Uh, have, have I done everything I can do? I don't know if it's blame, it's just questioning yourself. Detectives from the different counties set up a task force and the psychological profiling became more detailed, not only of the killer, but of the victims. The essential criteria that we brought to the table each time that we looked at it was that it would be a male associated with a vehicle on some relatively major highway and above the age of 30, always driving alone. That was a good description of Peter Seams. It was about two weeks after Barres had been found and Seams, a 65-year-old missionary, left home in his Pontiac Sunbird to drive to a Christian outreach meeting. He was a kind man and in the habit of picking up hitchhikers. He was never seen again except by a predator. All of the people that were associated with the task force saw the perpetrator of this crime or this series of crimes to be a predator because if she wanted just money, then she could have waited till people parked their cars at rest stops and broken in. terrified that she, the person responsible could keep killing people before you were able to catch them. Peter Seams was to become the fifth victim of the serial killer. And even though his body was never found, his Pontiac Sunbird provided the most important clues so far. <laughs> Rhonda Bailey, who lived on a quiet street, was sitting on her front porch with a cold drink. Oh, God. Are you all right? Are you all right? She was confronted by two hysterical women. Are you all right? She wanted to help, but soon realized this is no ordinary traffic accident. The driver and passenger had something to hide. Forget it. You are absolutely One woman was frantically wiping down the windshield and dashboard. What are you doing? What am I doing? 
Bailey realized there was a lot more to this than a car running into a telegraph pole. Stay out of it! You get out of my face! The hell Don't make she called the police, and they quickly established the car belonged to the missing Peter Seams. Crime scene analysts were soon collecting evidence. Got some bloody glass I'm gonna click. There's the pressure to solve the case and get a conviction, but I'm outside that loop. I have the pressure to collect the evidence and make sure I don't screw up the evidence in collecting it and getting the best evidence. And we may pick up 100 objects and 90, 90 of them don't really have any value, but at that time, we don't know. And I got some blood behind on this side. On the door rest of the driver's side was a bloody palm print. And Wanda Bailey was able to help the police build photo fits. Those and the palm print finally gave the investigation the focus it needed. Nice middle-aged white man to be found shot to death in the past year. That didn't stop the killing, though. September 12th, Dick Humphreys, 56-year-old from Crystal River in Marion County, a private detective, shot the man, seven times. Was found miles from his body. The killing was getting more frequent, more routine. At that point in my career, I guess every phone call was potentially bad, and you had a bad feeling about it until you knew it was family or some friend. Meanwhile, back in Daytona, there was Bob Kelly. He was still grappling with Warnos's first murder, Richard Mallory's, still unable to discover any motive or any clues. And yet not realizing that his case was the first of a series of brutal murders. Say, Bob. Hey, Bruce. <laughs> how, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good to see you. What brings you down here? Yeah. Huh? Then he had a oh, visit by a colleague from another county. Oh, yeah. here. Things are good. Things are good. I got one uh, homicide. Yeah, that sounds they had a lone male found in an isolated area, dead, shot several times, mostly with a 22 caliber handgun. Uh, the ones that were fully dressed or dressed were, had their pockets pulled inside out. The car was found 10 to 20 miles in a different location. There were men traveling by themselves. It just went on and on that uh, they were pictures of Mallory's situation. Yeah, send those over to me. I'll call you right back after I get them. Kelly oh, hadn't thanks. even known about the detectives in the inter-county task force, but now he contacted them, told them about Mallory, and got a fax of the photo fits. Now he was in on the hunt. In less than a year, seven men had died. The latest on November the 11th was Walter Gino Antonio, a 60-year-old sheriff's assistant from Coker in Dixie County, married, shot four times. All right, Jerry, let's take a look at what we got here. Almost a year after he'd taken on the Mallory case, Bob Kelly found himself on a team of detectives from five counties, all looking for the same killer. The task force had to work together to stop the killing. Steering wheel? Yes, steering wheel. Nothing in the trunk. The trunk was clear. No one person was more in charge of the task force than the other, and we all had a vote as to what actions we were going to take and the majority rule most of the time. Everybody came there prepared to work, ready to work, knowing the crime facts. It was unbelievable cooperation. Probably some of the better that I've ever seen. All right, Jerry, we're looking at seven That didn't mean there weren't disagreements. Bob Kelly, for instance, wanted to get the media involved and to give them photo fits. Jerry Thompson wanted to keep the general public out of it. Well, we threw the bogus ones. We need the help. We, put their we wanted to do whatever there. we could do to try to solve well, it. You know what's going to happen? As soon as it's a tough decision out. because you've got several factors. You don't want to give out everything you have, but in the same time, you've got the to start making the public aware of problems. what's going on. I think off. you've got to put people's safety, number one, and then number two, what can we gain by doing this? Where can we go? What kind of leads can we start to develop? I was probably the only one that was not 
in favor of releasing them at that point in time. I just didn't think it was the right time to do it. I didn't think we had enough facts gathered at the point, but it worked out. Sheriff's Department, may I help you please? The photo fits went out and the calls came in. In their hundreds. Yes. R E E. When you start telling people that you've got a female serial killer, it's definitely going to bring out a lot of different reactions from the news media, from the public. So, I mean, we were aware that we were going to start getting not only good leads, but we were going to get a lot of stuff that was of no value that we were going to have to try to eliminate and and sort through to determine where to go with it. Do you have a name? Susan. For one of the photo fits, there were three main names. Susan Blanovich, Cami Green, and Laurie Grody. For the other, there was one, Tyria Moore. Since most of the calls came from around Daytona, it was worth assuming that that's where the women were. Bob Kelly suggested checking the Daytona pawn shops for belongings of the murdered men. And sure enough, they found Richard Mallory's camera and radar detector and a pawn shop receipt with a thumbprint on it. The name on the receipt was Cammy Green, a false name, of course. The next move was to go to the state fingerprint files in Orlando. The state's fingerprints analysts had the job of putting a name to the print on the receipt. They ran it through the computer, nothing. That meant a grueling manual search. My partners, David Perry and Debbie Fisher, were a little bit reluctant as I was to do this because we were looking for the proverbial needle in the haystack. The only problem is, is that we didn't even know if the needle was in the haystack. We would be looking from half of the fingerprint cards in the Volusia County Sheriff's Office, which is tens and tens of thousands of fingerprint cards. And there was still a tinge in our brains that we're never going to find this. I was in the files for 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, David. there she was. David! It was almost an undescribable feeling. First, it was like I couldn't breathe. What? David, come here. You've got to check this. It was just my head started pounding. I couldn't breathe. I was very excited. <laughs> it was like this just cannot be happening this quick. Got it. <laughs> oh, you really did. This was just too easy for the phenomenal task that we thought we were undertaking. Well, well, what's the name? What's the name? And it said Eileen Carol Warnos. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, listen up. We got a positive ID on our killer, Eileen Carol Warnos. Right. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Now they had a face with a real name on it. All that was left was to find the actual woman and to find her before she killed again. Eileen Carol Warnos. From the hundreds of phone calls the task force received, several mentioned seeing a woman resembling the photo fit in some of Daytona's biker bars. She was said to like the biker's lifestyle, but the detectives would need to know a lot more than that. Certainly there was a sense of, of knowing you were close, you knew what you had, you knew that you had the person that committed the murder, but now you gotta prove it. And that's always the hard part. And the hard part calls for hard men. Undercover cops led by Mike Joyner. I try to live the life or get in the minds of people who commit crimes or, or I try to get to where I can think like them. Besides looking different, acting different at times, I'm just a normal human, human being like the rest of them. Mike Joyner was a narcotics investigator in Citrus County. Uh, probably the best narcotics officer I've ever been around. He can fit in in any 
situation. If it's a biker bar, he can adapt to the biker mode. If it's something in a suit, then that's the way he goes. God give me a talent to do this job. I believe it with all my heart. I use it to the best of my ability. I don't want to disappoint him, myself, or my family. So I rely on him to give me the strength to act the way I should when I'm around these people. We still had a lot to accomplish. We didn't know where she was located at, and uh, that, that was a fear of ours, that they would be more victims before we could find her. Mike Joyner and his partner dressed for their parts and set themselves up in the last resort, one of the most notorious biker bars in Daytona. But after days of drinking beer and shooting pool, there was no luck until a woman Joyner recognized sat down at the bar. It was Wernos. Myself, I was very relieved we found her. It was, it was more of a, a, a rush type relief, like here she is, uh, thank you, we finally found her. The adrenaline, the adrenaline, I mean, yeah, you're pumped because you're looking at somebody who's already killed seven people. But it's like, whew, finally, we got her in our sight. Maybe, maybe we can stop just killing after all. We were elated that we now knew where she was at. She was now under our control. And even though, you know, we wanted the case a little more solid at the time, we knew that we knew where she was at and we would do everything in our power to keep her from killing someone else. All the people that was, was undercover at that point in time was in danger. If any undercover officer ever tells you they're not scared, he just told you a fat ass lie, okay? So every undercover officer's scared. What are you gonna make? You're in my way. We were shooting pool. I mean, everything's going fine. I bought a beer, bought a cigarettes. Uh, I walked around her to get to the other side of the pool table, and I think I bumped her. When I walked by her, she hit me across the back with a pool stick. And I, you know, I turned around, you know, what the hell, what's that for? She says, I don't know, let's dance. Who do you think you are talking to me? To me like that? Mike was told not to get in a, her alone in a vehicle with just him and her. That somebody would always be with them. They would always be in the public. Because, you know, we, we knew she had killed all these people. And, and yes, he was potentially a, a victim. Before I go, you know, I just want to... You have to portray yourself as bad as they are. So look into their eyes and how do you feel when you get close to a serial killer? You absolutely do, do want to win and do your job. You need to go get us a couple more beers. How about today, maybe? She could pull the trigger just as good as a man can. It, I, I mean, just because she's a woman, it didn't make a rat's ass to me. She could kill quick as anybody. I wanted more than anything to catch them. Uh, I mean, enough, enough lives have been lost. I mean, some, it had to stop somewhere. Come on, quit talking about the shower. As Joyner was trying to work his way into Warnus's good graces, Bob Kelly outside was keeping an eye on things. The whole point of the undercover operation was to gather enough evidence to arrest Warnus and get her convicted. And like any good undercover job, it was secret, even from the local Orange County police. So when a patrol car pulled up at the last resort, the whole project threatened to collapse. Somebody had seen Warnos there, recognized her from the photo fit, and called the police. If the police arrested her now, they might not have enough evidence to keep her, and she could disappear. I got on the phone to a supervisor with the Port Orange Police Department and asked them to please uh, allow Warnos to remain in the pub to, and to back away because we had her under surveillance and that we were watching her. And uh, for about 30 seconds, it was we were terrified that they were going to arrest her because we wanted to follow her. We wanted to see where the, she might take us for evidence purposes. And Port Orange agreed. They had no problem at all. They supervisor radioed to her two uniformed officers to uh, just go ahead and back out and and uh, not take any action. You have to get going. You got to go now. You got to call. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. There you go, huh? That was close. Yeah, buddy. 
constantly played the, the jukebox. I mean, just constantly. She was very emotional at times. She would a song would come on and she would get very sad about it, and then another song would come on and she'd get real, real hyper about it. Uh, drank beer all the time. I mean, I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of things. But I ain't never seen one woman drink no more beer than that woman to drink now. Uh, I thought I was pretty stout at it, but I ain't. I couldn't hold a bucket of water to a cup to her now because she's good drinking. Yes. After three days of continuous drinking, Warnes told Joyna she'd spent the night at the bar sleeping on an old car seat. Her money was running low, and her girlfriend, Tyria Moore, had left her and left town. She was in the mood for a new adventure. That night, she would have the opportunity. The last resort was giving a pig roast for a thousand bikers. We were in the bar drinking again, and we've been drinking for three days now. How was I feeling? I knew when I got through this detail, somebody's going to have to put me in detox. But I had drank more than I had drank in the last year in three days. Uh, I was tired and wore out. My partner was tired and wore out. More beers. I had found out about the biker party. And my concern was oh, okay. if we had 100, 150 more bikers come in and Eileen all of a sudden seen another man with more money than I had, she would go to him. If she got on the back of a bike, there's no way the oh, Taylor's team would ever know. That was one of the biggest concerns that when I went to the restroom, uh, I relayed that to my backup team. The decision was made that we just couldn't take the chance that she would get on the back of a motorcycle and be gone. And the chances of her disappearing were probably pretty great. So we decided to move in and make an arrest. If you go back up here. This was very definitely plan B, but the task force was well prepared for it. They'd found an old outstanding firearms warrant against Warnos, and that's what, in this police footage of the actual arrest, they were serving on her now. Hey. I need drones, man. What's wrong? I need an investigator who's able with the sheriff's office, Volusia County Warrants Division. Yeah. That's I ain't got the case. I ain't got nothing, man. Let me see some identification. I ain't got At the same time, Joyner, when he was also arrested, had to keep playing his part. She trusted him and he might be needed again. I don't think she ever suspected me of being law enforcement law. I really don't. I mean, we got arrested together. They put us uh, in the back seat of the car. We were talking back there. I want to know what the hell is going on here. I'm sure after being in jail a couple of days and coming around, she, she knew what time it was then. We had the murderer, but we couldn't prove it. If we had to go to trial on what we had that day, you couldn't prove that, that she'd committed those murders. Warnos was finally where the task force wanted her, up to a point. She was in jail all right, but on the not very serious firearms charge. She had no idea she was suspected of the murders. As for evidence, the stakeout hadn't been fruitless. At one point, Warnos had shown Joyner the key to her storage lockup and told him where the lockup was. So, after the prison took her possessions, all Kelly needed to do was pick up the key and drive out to see what she had. She had plenty, though very little of it was worth much. They were odds and ends mainly, but most of them were traceable to the murdered men. They were something solid to take to court, and they were also a gift to a psychological profiler. When you look at the types of items that she kept and, and took and, and maintained, uh, many of the things were not of particular value. The kind of things that she kept to me were much more a trophy, a trophy of a person who had overcome and won as opposed to somebody who avoided being a victim themselves. But as evidence, Warnos's trophies were like the bloody palm print on Peter Seam's car, circumstantial. The most the print could really prove was that she had been in the car, not that she'd killed Seams. That and the trophies might be enough to convince a jury, but there was an outside chance they might not. What the strike force wanted was watertight certainty. The strike force wanted a confession, and they had the key to getting one. Tyria Moore.
In a Daytona motel room, a team that included Jerry Thompson and Mike Joyner sat with Warnos's former girlfriend and, with her, developed a plan for persuading Warnos to confess. Moore was cooperative, and not just because of a threat of arrest as Warnos's accessory. Her five years with Warnos had been turbulent, and she was afraid of her. Just a regular conversation. I'll take care of me. Tyria Moore was uh, a personable person. Interviewing her, you could tell that she was not directly involved in the murders. Ty was very much happy to get Eileen out of her life. Ty was scared to death of Eileen Warner. She was very much intimidated by her. Uh, Tyria was very much a follower, not a leader. And Eileen Warner was very much a leader. If she couldn't be in control, she didn't want no part of it. The equipment's going to pick everything up. I think Ty was, uh, she was very much relieved that at least she was with the cops and working with the cops and not having to run from the cops. It's a lot more phone. Moore phoned the prison and left a message asking Warnos to phone her back on the motel number. The detectives wanted Warnos to confess, and they hoped that Moore could steer the conversation to the subject of the murders. They fed her questions. What follows is the police tape of the actual yeah. conversation. Hey, Ty? Yeah. What are you doing? Nothing. What the hell are you doing? Nothing. I'm sitting here in jail. Yeah, it's what I heard. How are you going down here? I came down here to see what the hell is happening. Everything's copacetic. I'm in here for uh, um, carrying a concealed weapon back in It should have been simple. Warnos knew more knew about the murders, and she didn't know she herself was suspected. But she also thought a prison phone would be bound to be tapped and wouldn't touch the subject. The plan was going nowhere. You know, I don't think there should be... It was very stressful. It was hot. It was humid. Uh, we were confined to a motel. Yeah, it's going to be OK. Hours became days. Warnos by now would talk about the murders, but only to deny any involvement. After three days, Thompson and Joyner decided on a new tactic. If Warnos thought the police were after Moore for the murders, would she confess to save her former lover? Moore gradually made Eileen Warnos feel guilty. Do whatever you gotta do. I love you so much. I know that. I'm willing to give up my life. I don't care anymore. Don't cry. Well, quit crying and I won't. They both became upset. Wernos suddenly went from cold-hearted killer to a concerned lover. It's still long. Aww. How do you help me find somebody so good? <sighs> Eventually, she agreed to talk to the police and confess to the killings. No, I don't. She'd said she'd tell the police the truth. There's nobody in this room but me. Bye. It had worked. Well, it was very rewarding that we had done all this work for months and that she was going to admit to the cases that she was involved in. And it was just a good feeling. The next morning, as promised, Warnos told the police everything. We were very very enthusiastic that we got a confession. I mean, there's no getting around that. But work's half done. I mean, we know we got a lot more to do. At this point, we can probably relax a little bit more because we're not working 15-hour days. So now you can slow down a little bit. The person that's committed the murders is in jail. She's not going to kill anybody else. And now it's a methodical day by day. Let's uh, get the job done, and you can probably cut it down to 12-hour days. When I first saw her, when I first realized who I was looking at, I mean, it, it, she did fit the bill of what I was looking at as a serial killer. She was a cold, hard individual, and she just doesn't fit into what society believes should be the norm. She doesn't go home every night. She doesn't have a normal family. She does what she has to do to survive, and if that means killing somebody, that means killing somebody. Eileen Carol Warnos, 34, grew up in Michigan. A father who left her teenage mother before Eileen was born was convicted of child rape and later killed in prison. 
Her mother disappeared when she was six months old, and she was raised by her heavy drinking grandparents. Sex came early and frequently, especially after she learned that men would give her things in return for it. Pregnant at 14, child taken away. A working prostitute not long after, known to be violent. Two and a half years for armed robbery. Sex, violence and robbery came together when she enticed, killed and robbed seven men in one year. America's first woman serial murderer. It was justifiable homicide. Although by the time of her trial, a year after her arrest, she was declaring her innocence. She was very clear and, and, and uh, articulate in her testimony and appeared to know what she was doing. She thought she could fool the jury. She thought she had a chance to fool this jury. And uh, when she found out she didn't, she was mad. Scumbag of America. I was raped. I hope you get raped. That's not the way the jurors... The trial lasted three days. The jury gave its verdict on January 16th, 1992. We, the jury, found the defendant, Eileen Carroll Warnes, guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. Safely kept. And the judge delivered the ultimate sentence. Are you, Eileen Carroll Warnes, be electrocuted until you are dead? I mean, you're, you're happy that you got a conviction? You're happy that she's sentenced? You know, you want to see people get what they deserve, but, you know, it's still a person that's now being sentenced to die. If I was a victim's family member, I think those people get a lot more out of the fact that someone dies in the electric chair. To me, it's just part of the job. It's part of something that that's the punishment that the state has set forth, and I, I agree with it. I don't get any special satisfaction out of it, though. could easily see that if she hadn't been arrested when she did, that this would have gone on and on, and many other men would have become victimized, and as a result, many other families would be missing the man in their life. Well, I guess the good thing is when you identify who the actual killer is, and you bring, bring closure to not only the case, but to someone's loved ones, their, their family, and they don't have to lay awake at night wondering who killed their loved one. Now, now they know. The killings began with the death of Richard Mallory, and the case against Warnos began with Bob Kelly's investigation of it. Kelly has investigated a lot of cases in 10 years since, but Mallory and Warnos are still vivid in his memory. I think Eileen Warnos is a predator. I think that she was out there applying her trade and that nobody else in this world mattered but Eileen Warnos. She's not crazy. She knew what she was doing. Once she killed Mallory, I don't think the, the others were hard at all. It was a different type of investigation just because of who she was and, and how it all went down. It was entertaining to be involved in a task force situation. It was exciting at times. It was frustrating at other times. It was very satisfying to be part of the investigation. Eileen Warnos has been on death row at Broward Correctional Institution near Miami for the last eight years. She's had several appeals, all of them unsuccessful. Her next appeal will probably be her last.